Welcome to the Gravity Engine 3.0 Orbit tutorial. We'll begin with an almost empty scene. What I've done here is taken a Unity scene. I've added a game object called Gravity Engine, and I've attached a Gravity Engine component. And I've grabbed the prefab that's provided in Gravity Engine for a mission camera, which is just a camera that has a camera spin script attached to it so that you can move the camera around and zoom in and out with the mouse wheel, which are just things I like to have in scenes to make navigation a little bit easier. So if we want to create objects in specific orbital paths, we want to make use of a new component in 3.0 called Orbit Universal. So to set the stage for that, we'll grab a star object and drop it into the scene at the origin, 0, 0, 0 here. It's got a mass of 100. We'll grab a planet object and make it a child of the star. And this planet has a mass of 1. And then if we want an orbit, we just go to Add Component and we pick Orbit Universal. You'll notice there is an orbit ellipse component and an orbit hyper component. These are uh, inversions before 3.0, the way orbits would be specified. There is now a more general and in many ways more powerful component that allows you to do not only ellipse and hyperbola, but also parabola. So going forward, uh, I recommend using that. There are a number of uh, choices for how we set the shape parameters, uh, and then common to all orbits are the orientation parameters, the uh, angles that define the three-dimensional orientation of the orbit in space. So notice that by making the planet a child of the star, when we add the orbit universal component, it automatically assumes that the parent object is the object around which this planet should be orbiting, so it fills in the center and body component directly, which is convenient. If you wish to set the parameters explicitly with numbers uh, and double precision, then the parameter choice double is appropriate. And then you set the eccentricity and the semi-parameter of the orbit. And we use semi-parameter because it applies to both ellipses and hyperbolas. It's more general. If you know that you want an elliptical orbit, you can go ahead and choose ellipse major axis A. And in this case, we also, for convenience, provide sliders for eccentricity and the orientations. So this is very convenient. We can grab the slider to change the eccentricity. We can grab the various angles here and see them move dynamically. There's a slight drawback to the use of sliders, which is it's only possible to get floating point precision for the values here. So if you really require double precision for your orbit parameters, you can always go back and pick double. If you prefer instead to not specify the eccentricity, but to explicitly specify the distance closest approach, which is the perigee and the farthest away apogee, technically it should be periaps and apoaps. But uh, we'll use the terms apogee and perigee, even though they're technically, they mean an orbit around the Earth, and this isn't necessarily the Earth, but I think that will be relatively clear to all the users. Uh, and you can explicitly set the distances for the apogee and perigee. We do require the apogee be greater than the perigee, so we can, for example, if we want to make the orbit have a maximum distance of 30, and then a minimum distance of 10, we can do that. Notice here that you, after updating these shape parameters, have to hit return, and that's so that we don't update when you've just typed one or two digits, which can lead to some numerical problems until you have the correct value in place. So if we now want to have this orbit in our scene, we can just hit play, and what will happen is this will operate as an in-body object, so Gravity Engine will do an n-body simulation calculating the force to the star and the force imparted by any other planets or stars that would be in the scene and move it forward in time. So we'll press play and we can see that our planet is moving. It would be very handy if we could see the predicted orbit that was going to be followed. Uh, it just adds a some visual perspective to the scene. So we can do that using a component called an orbit predictor. 
So in order to do that, we'll create a new empty game object as a child here. We'll say orbit predictor. And we will add the orbit predictor component. And that will automatically add a line renderer because what the orbit predictor will do is create a line that shows the future path of the object. So down in the orbit predictor, we have two fields to fill in the center object, which is going to be the star. Drag that in. The body that is actually doing the orbiting, so that's going to be the planet. And then we should really put a material on this line renderer, otherwise we're going to get the default material. So we'll go into our resources folder, materials. Uh, we'll take this red color, drop it on our orbit predictor. And we'll narrow this so we get a bit of a thinner line when we look at the resulting render. And so now you can see the path that the object has taken. Now there's no guarantee it will follow this path. If we had other masses in the scene, then as they influence this body, the shape of the future orbit would be different. And at each time step, this orbit is re-predicted based on the current position and velocity of this body here. So that's an important thing to bear in mind with the orbit predictor case. Now we can continue to make these orbits hierarchical. So let's go back to a somewhat larger circular orbit. We'll make this planet perhaps a little bit heavier so it could hold a moon. And we'll grab another from our prefabs here. We'll just grab the same planet again, just as a model, and make it a child of this one. And then we'll call it, it change its name to moon. And so this moon is an n body with a mass of one. Compared to a star, a moon is essentially massless, so we'll call that zero. And we want this moon to be in orbit around the planet, so we'll again add an orbit universal. And let's say we want our moon to be, say, in an orbit two units away from the star. And also, we'll just copy this orbit predictor and put it under the moon, remembering, sorry, put it under the moon. And remembering that we now need to update these center object and body parameters because for the moon they're different. So the body that's doing the orbiting is the moon and the thing that's orbiting around is the planet. And in order to help us uh, see it visually a little bit differently, we'll uh, just make that blue instead of red. And we have the width change we made last time. So now we can go ahead and start this scene. And what we have is a very strange looking not circular orbit. And that's the actual end body orbit that would happen. And what's happening here is we have three body physics going on. There is the planet, the star, and the moon, and the influence of the star is causing this orbit of the moon to be changed as it moves around. Now we could change that a couple of ways. We could make the planet heavier. So if we made the planet say 20 uh, and made the star, well, we'll leave the star the same, then we're going to have a somewhat better orbit, but you can see it's still not the circular orbit that we wanted to have. So when we look at this in the inspector here, you can see the intention is to have a circular orbit. Gravity doesn't actually let you have a circular orbit. That's, that's not the correct uh, physical behavior, so we can't achieve that using in-body physics. But what we can do if we would really like to have that circular orbit for gameplay reasons, is we can change the moon to instead of evolving using gravity engine to evolve using Kepler's equation. What that will do is it will require the moon to stay in this circular orbit, even as the moon moves due to the gravitational influence of the star. So if we do this now, 
with the Moon and Kepler mode. We now have a nice Moon in circular orbit around the planet, and then the planet is moving around the star. In fact, you'll notice that the star is wobbling a little bit. And that's because when we made the planet heavier, we moved the center of mass of the planet out a little bit. And so that's causing a bit of a drift here as we go around. So what's going to happen is the star is going to move in a circle around. So these are both orbiting around their common center of mass here. So that also may not be what we want. So what we could do is we could move the planet so that it uses Kepler equations. And we can make the star fixed if we wish by adding a component called fixed object, which tells Gravity Engine to compute the gravitational force caused by this mass, but to not move this mass itself. So if we make all of those fixed and put the planet on rails in Kepler mode, we now get our kind of clockwork, but not physically accurate planetary system the way we want. Now there's another advantage to having all of the components in the scene in this clockwork mode, which is that we can control time and move time forward and backwards. What happens when we use this Kepler's equation is that at any instant in time, we compute the position in the fixed orbit that we should be. So we can jump forwards and backwards in time with, without any problem. When all of the objects in the scene are using n-body mode, we have to simulate all of the time from now till the time we jump to, which can be quite a computational burden. If everything is on rails, we don't need to do that. We can just jump to that time. So a good way to illustrate this is to add a little component that does this within Gravity Engine that's called a time slider. It relies on a UI element of a slider, so we'll first have to do a little bit of UI work here. So we'll add a canvas, just make it up at the top level. We'll add a slider, and then we'll go to scene view and have a look at our slider. And using shift and alt, we will align to the bottom and we will make our slider a little bit bigger, say 400 and offset it maybe 30 so we can grab it. And then to the slider here, we will come down and add a component called time slider. And the time slider assumes that the left-hand side of the slider is time zero and the right-hand side of the slider is max time. So we'll, max time of 200 is probably okay. Uh, we need to tell it what slider it's attached to. And what this component will do is if you grab this slider and put it at a particular position, it will move the scene to that particular time. And since everything is on rails, everything can just jump to that particular time. So if we go ahead and press play here, we have our slider at the bottom, the planet's moving. I can now grab this and I can just move forwards and backwards in time and change what's going on in the orbital evolution of my system. So I have a complete clockwork universe and the ability to move forward and backwards. Now, once again, this is a clockwork planetary system. It's not a gravitationally accurate gravi gravitational system. If you wish to do that, then you move everything back to not Kepler mode, but gravity engine mode, and it will evolve. There are ways to see the future paths of objects using uh, an element within gravity engine called trajectory prediction. Uh, and if that's of interest to you, there is a separate tutorial on that topic. I hope this provided some background about how to set up orbits in Gravity Engine. Thanks for your attention.